On this episode of Skeptico, Alex talks with renowned philosopher and consciousness researcher, Dr. John Searle. The real kicker that we run across and keep pounding on because it just won't go away is near-death experience science. I mean, here are these doctors in, in hospital, carefully controlled experiments over and over again. The brain, which you're talking about, Dr. Searle, is gone, is non-functioning, isn't there, and yet some kind of conscious experience that's able to be recalled and see what's going on continues. That evidence is pretty overwhelming at this point. What do you do with that? I don't know. The stuff that I know about this tends to be rather anecdotal. Uh, now, maybe there is some really systematic, large-scale study of near-death experience that shows you can have consciousness without a brain. There's a lot of published work on this. You know, the best compilation is probably the Handbook of Near-Death Experiences, edited by Jan Holden at University of North Texas. We've interviewed her. And, of course, Bruce Grayson at University of Virginia, who's very well known in this area. I don't know enough about this stuff to have an intelligent opinion. And, of course, it might turn out uh, that the uh, the 100 years from now, we'll have this conversation in, in heaven, or in my case, more likely the other place. I, the idea that uh, you had to have a brain in order to be conscious, that was kind of a silly idea that people had back in the 21st century. That might turn out that way. I don't think it will. Stay with us for Skeptico. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sakaris, and on today's episode, I have an interview with Dr. John Searle. Now, before I get to the interview with Dr. Searle, I want to tee up a question for you. As you know, I usually do this at the end of the show, but since the question relates to the quote that you just heard... And since the question relates to something else I want to talk about before I get into the interview, I'm going to throw it out there now. Here's the question. How do you explain Dr. Searle's willful ignorance of near-death experience science? Moreover, why is he so clueless about parapsychology, hypnosis, self-directed neuroplasticity? Now, I know I didn't get into those last couple of them with him, but you know where he would go with those. Why does he think it's okay to summarily dismiss any evidence that points to a model of consciousness other than the hopelessly obsolete mind equals brain clunker that we talk so much about? So in order to pull this apart, let me return to the near-death experience science for a minute, because that, to me, is always the most dramatic example of an evidence-based kill shot to the already dead mind equals brain carcass. I mean, think about this. Here's this guy, highly acclaimed, internationally renowned expert on consciousness. He gives TED Talks and is invited to scholarly symposiums on consciousness all over the world. How can that guy be less informed about the published peer-reviewed literature on near-death experience than your average Oprah Winfrey fan. I mean, it's not like he doesn't understand what's at stake. As you'll hear, he gets that this survival of consciousness question is absolutely central to all other scientific assumptions that we could make about consciousness. So why is Dr. Searle so shamelessly, unapologetically ignorant of the science? Well, that's the other thing I wanted to talk to you about before we get into this interview, and that is science bullies. You know, back in March of this year, 2013, Robert McLuhan published an article on his website, and I'll link to it in the show notes, about the organized effort of skeptics slash atheists to rig Wikipedia. Now, these folks, by organizing themselves into this tight-knit team and dedicating themselves to making literally thousands 
of these little rule bending Wikipedia changes. And by targeting it to a small number of pages, by doing all that, these self-described guerrilla skeptics have had remarkable success. For example, if you go to parapsychology on Wikipedia and you bounce to any of the links that parapsychology would lead you to, I mean, it's a lost cause. I mean, it's absolutely impossible to get anything close to a neutral point of view from Wikipedia on any of those topics. If you don't know what I mean and you have a strong stomach, I mean, go to Wikipedia and find out for yourself. If you listen to this show very much and you have a really strong stomach, search for Psychic Detective and read that one. And if after doing that, you're appropriately outraged and you have this serious masochistic streak in you, well then open up the Wikipedia editor and try straightening out one of those pages. I mean, this is what you're supposed to be able to do, right? Wikipedia is an open source encyclopedia. Anyone with knowledge on the subject is supposed to be able to edit, right? Well, if that's what you think, hold on, I can save you a lot of time and a lot of frustration. As a matter of fact, as a primer, before you go and do that, let me point you to another blog post, one that was just recently published on Reality Sandwich by Craig Weiler titled, The Wikipedia Battle for Rupert Sheldrick's Biography. Take a look at that, and then also take a look at Rupert Sheldrick's article on the same topic. I have links to both of them in the show notes. But take a look at that and see what these guys have done to Sheldrick's biography and to other pages, and you'll really have a sense for what I'm talking about. But before you get too worked up about that, and I don't think you will get too worked up about that, because as a listener to this show, you know that the fundamentalist skeptics can rival any religious cult. But what you may be surprised to discover from Craig's post and by going to Wikipedia is the zeal with which these groups are targeting science. I mean, take a step back. Rupert Sheldrick, after all, isn't a Bible thumper. He's not a creationist. He hasn't taken a stance against a woman's right to choose or anything like that. I mean, he's a Cambridge biologist who wrote a book about dogs that know when their owners are coming home. And he followed it up with his recent book about how science might want to be a little bit less dogmatic about defending the materialistic status quo. Of course, that book is Science Set Free. We dedicated a whole show to it a little bit back. But at the end of the day, the issue for me is not guerrilla skeptics on Wikipedia or iTunes or Reddit or any of the other places these people go to try and heal their meaningless by definition lives. That is, after all, what these folks believe. Life is meaningless. The universe is meaningless. You are meaningless. But the real problem, I think, is the impact they have on Dr. John Searle. Because you see, Berkeley philosophy professor Dr. John Searle is not a professional skeptic. He's not a fire-breathing, you-are-a-biological-robot atheist. In fact, within the mainstream science community, he's seen as a progressive because he's willing to reject the silliness of this consciousness is an illusion, you don't really have any experiences kind of nonsense that many still hold to. But here's the thing. When it comes to the really tough stuff, the stuff that would truly set science free from the materialistic, reductionistic, atheistic dogma that cripples it, Searle is willfully ignorant. Now, is it an ignorance born out of a chummy academic life and a long list of accomplishments that he can rest on? Perhaps. But I think this ignorance is also a byproduct of a materialistic science culture that has been traumatized into a complacency by these skeptical bullies who push and shove and spit insults at any free thinker in academia who dares to challenge their status quo. It's not like Searle is playing to the skeptics. He's unwittingly absorbed their worldview into his own without forethought or deliberation. And that's the greatest threat to science. So let's hear from Dr. John Searle. It's a short interview. I really just ran out of things to say to a guy who thinks that parapsychology died with 
J.B. Ryan back in 1980. Today we welcome esteemed Berkeley philosophy professor Dr. John Searle to Skeptico. Dr. Searle has a worldwide reputation for his acclaimed work on the philosophy of mind and language. He's the author of over a dozen books and hundreds of articles and papers exploring issues of consciousness and mind-body mysteries. Dr. Searle, welcome to Skeptico. Thanks so much for joining me. Well, thanks for having me. So first off, Dr. Scholl, I have to say when I was doing this preparation for this show, I saw here you are. In, do you still teach philosophy 132, philosophy of mind at Berkeley? Absolutely. In fact, uh, I'm just starting a new semester. I teach full time. And after I get through talking with you, I'm going to meet my uh, teaching assistants, my graduate student instructors. I got a big class, so it's gonna, I'm going to have at least three of them. I have a, at least 150 people in the class. Well, I think it's fantastic that a kid can still go to a public university in California and walk into a class, and there's a Rhodes Scholar PhD from Oxford teaching the class. I mean, that's, that's kind of rare these days, so that's, that's really great. Terrific. Let's see. On this show, Skeptico, we've been banging away at this issue of consciousness and the nature of consciousness for quite some time. This is right up your alley. Let me start with a two-part question, if I could. First off, for those folks who don't know, you were probably one of the first prominent academics to publicly take a stand on this consciousness is an illusion silliness, if you will. So the first question is, are we past that? Are we past consciousness is an illusion? And the second part that I want to throw in there before you respond is, why the heck did it take so long? I mean, it seems pretty obvious, I think, to most people yeah. that consciousness isn't an illusion. W what's the answer? Okay, well, I don't think we're past it. Uh, and the reason is that there is this a tradition uh, that says uh, if consciousness exists, well, it couldn't be part of the physical world. But the physical world is the only world there is, so consciousness doesn't exist. It's an illusion. Now, I think that's a silly argument, but that's uh, uh, the way that it goes. Now, there's a hi history behind this, and the history is uh, that the people who talked about consciousness often were people who did it for some religious reason. That is, they, they thought consciousness was part of God, the soul, and immortality. And if if the only world that exists is the world described by uh, physics and other natural sciences, then it, look like, it looks like consciousness cannot exist. I think those views are silly. Consciousness is a biological phenomenon. It's as real as any other biological phenomena. However, it is distinctive in that the way that you show that something is an illusion won't work for consciousness. So you can show that rainbows and sunsets are illusion because uh, – there's a distinction between how things seem to you and how they really are. Uh, it seems like there's an arch in the sky, the rainbow, but it isn't really. It's just an illusion. But where consciousness is concerned, where the very existence of consciousness is concerned, you can't make that distinction. You can't make the distinction between it consciously seeming to you that you are conscious and whether or not you really are conscious, because if it consciously seems to you that you're conscious, then you are conscious. So really, there are two parts to the answer to this. One is there's a traditional confusion that suggests that if consciousness really exists, it can't be part of the real physical world. And I'm saying, of course it is. It's a biological phenomenon like digestion or photosynthesis. And then there's another confusion that fails, uh, whereby people fail to see that you can't make the illusion reality distinction for the very existence of consciousness. Now, I thought that I wiped out these mistakes 20 or 30 years ago, but they keep coming up again. I don't, I think it's going to keep up uh, for quite a while because uh, we don't yet have a thorough going account of how the brain causes consciousness. And until we do that, there are always going to be people who think, well, it's not a part of the physical world. Okay. But, don't you think that this is partially responsible for the public distrust of science to a certain extent? And let me go with this for a minute. You know, when we hear prominent philosophers, but more importantly, prominent scientists, neuroscientists, brain scientists, promoting this idea, and then people look back and they go, when they really think about it, they go, wait a minute, this not only defies common sense, 
but it's completely at odds with almost every aspect of our society, our legal system, our political system, not yeah. to mention science and medicine is built on the idea that you are a conscious being and that your decisions make a difference. You can decide you have free will, which is part, I don't want to get too far into that whole thing, but it's yeah. woven completely into our society. Don't you think that kind of contributes for this underlying sense of distrust that a lot of people have for science? Well, I think it does contribute. Uh, I think that the leading intellectual problem in philosophy, at least, and maybe the leading problem overall, is how do we give an account of our human reality of consciousness? Uh, we think we have free will, uh, mental life. We have uh, society and ethics and aesthetics. How do we give an account of that that shows that it's a part of physical and chemical reality? And now, so far, we haven't succeeded in doing that. And people aren't willing to give up on the common sense conception of life. So sometimes this gives them an anti-scientific attitude. I don't think it happens um, um, uh, among professional intellectuals. I don't doubt if there's much of that in the better universities. But certainly politically, there's a mistrust of science and feeling, a feeling some or other that our human reality is being denied by science. Now, I think that's a terrible mistake. I think what we've got to do, and this is one of the main tasks of philosophy – is to give an account that shows that the human reality is not only consistent with scientific reality, it's a natural consequence of it. Once you've got uh, uh, electrons and uh, protons and neutrons and subatomic particles, then it's just a matter of time and random recombination until evolution gives you life, uh, consciousness, ethics, society, and all the rest of it. Now, that's something that you've put forward both here a couple times about consciousness being biological, consciousness right. being an evolutionary phenomenon in the physical world and all that. I've also heard quotes from you, and I wanted to clarify on this, that you are open to the possibility that consciousness is somehow fundamental and that our physical reality is somehow in some way we can't f fully understand or explain a phenomena of consciousness. Any thoughts on that? Well, I think it's very unlikely. Of course, it might turn out uh, that uh, consciousness is one of the basic uh, features of reality. But as far as we know anything about how it actually works, consciousness only exists in human and animal brains, and not even all animals, but in human and uh, some animal brains. But other than that, there are no known cases of consciousness. Uh, plants aren't conscious. Mountains and rivers and waterfalls and uh, planets are not conscious. Now, we have to assume that consciousness exists in the universe outside our little Earth because, you know, we're only one. Uh, our little solar system is only one star of 100 billion stars in our uh, galaxy. And our galaxy is only one of 100 billion galaxies. So we have to assume that we're not the only place in the universe that has life and consciousness. But we don't know about the other places. And maybe they're totally unlike what we have. Well, I think even that statement that you just made would draw a lot of controversy from some folks who say, how do we know plants aren't conscious? How do we know cells aren't conscious? How do we know well, our DNA yeah. isn't conscious? And I well, it's not a serious hypothesis. Um, I mean, I, if you take, a, a let's say, an amoeba, why isn't it conscious? Well, it hasn't got the right kind of machinery. Um, of course, I don't know. But that presupposes something we don't know, and that is, you know, what is the nature of con consciousness? How does consciousness arise? When does yeah. consciousness begin? When does it end? Doesn't it? I mean, it's kind of a loop. Look, I can't prove to you that my shoes are not conscious. Okay, maybe they're thinking... I wish this bastard wouldn't walk on me all day long. You know, I can't prove that they're not conscious. It's just not a serious hypothesis. Uh, we know that consciousness exists in certain rather specific parts of the world. And uh, shoes and ships and sealing wax and mountains and molecules and tectonic plates just don't have the right kind of machinery to be conscious. Now, of course, I can't prove to you that my shoes aren't conscious, but it's not a serious hypothesis. It's not something I think, well, boy, we ought to get busy and make sure that we prove that shoes aren't conscious. It's just not serious. Yeah, I think the hard part there is where we draw the line in terms of seriousness. Uh, plants, yeah. there's been some interesting research 
for a long time suggesting that plants react to people in certain situations or there's some kind of field effect that we don't understand. But before we even... Plants have all kinds of sensitivities and reactions. But I don't really think for a moment that the grass under my feet is thinking, gosh, it's terrible the way this guy keeps walking on us and that awful lawnmower that he runs over us. Uh, of course, I can't prove that the, that the grass isn't conscious, but again, it's not something that's worth worrying about. Okay, let's move on to maybe some topics that are worth worrying about and would would violate this notion that consciousness is purely biological and maybe would push us in the other direction that consciousness is somehow fundamental. And let me go through a couple of these and tell me if you think they have any potential to violate or challenge that in any way. So I'd just start with hypnosis. Does hypnosis yeah. in any way violate the idea that consciousness is purely biological and the, the mind is not an active agent that can do anything? Well, not as far as I know anything about hypnosis. Uh, what you do is you get to people who are susceptible to certain kinds of suggestions, and they're very, they tend to be rather cooperative, and they'll go along with the, what the hypnotist suggests. I'm not sure everybody can be hypnotized. I'm not sure I could be hypnotized. I'm, I'm naturally very resistant, re resistant to anything like that. But hyp hypnosis definitely exists, and it exists like all forms of consciousness in uh, human brains. Uh, and I think uh, we ought to study it more. I think it's a, a phenomenon that's worthy of more curiosity than I have given it. So l let me just be clear as I kind of go through this little laundry list here. You're of the opinion that consciousness is ontologically distinct from the brain? Yes or no? I mean, is well, consciousness a different? Is consciousness different and can act differently? Because yeah. then I think you could fit hypnosis into that category. Hey, there's this thing called consciousness we don't understand, and it kind of works differently. And then it can cause blisters on your hand and do all this stuff that you may not be consciously aware of, but it's kind of doing it. Consciousness is a feature of the brain. It is a feature of the brain that's caused by the behavior of lower level elements, uh, neurons as far as we know, and it's realized in the brain as a higher level feature. An analogy I like to use is water. Liquidity is not an extra juice squirted out by the water. It's just a condition uh, that the system is in when the molecules are behaving in a certain way. You get the molecules to slow down and it stops being liquid, it becomes ice. But the solidity and the liquidity are not separate things, they're features of the whole system. In the same way, my brain goes from consciousness to unconsciousness when I fall asleep and then becomes conscious again. But the consciousness and the unconsciousness are not separate entities, they are features of the brain, they're conditions or states that the brain is in. So roughly speaking, consciousness is to the brain as liquidity is to water. And the, and the system can go from being liquid to being solid in the same way the conscious brain can go from being conscious to being unconscious. Okay, I get that. I hear that. Um, what we've been exploring, I think, is some of the evidence that suggests that maybe that's not true. And we really started with parapsychology and folks like Rupert Sheldrick from Cambridge or Dean Radin, who used to be at Bell Labs and is at IONS and have done all these precognition experiments and telepathy experiments, highly suggestive that that's going on. But put all that aside, because the real kicker that we run across and keep pounding on because it just won't go away is near-death experience science. I mean, here are these doctors in, in hospital, carefully controlled experiments over and over again. The brain, what you're talking about, Dr. Searle, is gone, is non-functioning, isn't there, and yet some kind of conscious experience that's able to be recalled and see what's going on continues. That evidence is pretty overwhelming at this point. What do you do with that? How does that fit yeah, into I, your... I don't know. The stuff that I know about this tends to be rather anecdotal. Uh, now, maybe there is some really systematic, large-scale study of near-death experience that shows you can have consciousness without a brain. But I don't know of any such uh, study. And uh, what I've heard is largely anecdotal. Now, the mistake that people made is, now that they tend to make is, they think, well, look, 
either these people are lying or there's a miracle. And of course, it, it, both of those are probably wrong. The people are perfectly sincere who report near-death experiences, but it, uh, it, it doesn't follow that you can have a consciousness completely separated from the brain, that they have a, that this miracle has actually taken place. I'd have to know a whole lot more about it and see more systematic studies. As I said, the, the accounts that I've heard tend to be anecdotal. They tell a story about a guy who's had uh, some unusual experiences. Well, there's a lot of published work on this. You know, the best compilation is probably the Handbook of Near-Death Experiences published by uh, edited by Jan Holden at University of North Texas. We've interviewed her. Yeah. And, of course, Bruce Grayson at the University of Virginia, who's very well known in this area. But I'll just give you a taste for what they've done. I mean, is, I think one of the simplest and most convincing experiments is in hospital, in cardiac arrest ward. They take people. They have a cardiac arrest. They die. They're resuscitated. And then they go and they interview these people, and they say – okay, tell us about your resuscitation. And they yeah. have a control group, that is people that didn't claim to have a near-death experience, and then they have their study group, people who did have a near-death experience, and yeah. then they compare, it's a pretty simple kind of protocol, compare the amount of hits they get in recounting their resuscitation. When they were dead, they didn't have a brain. Compare the control group who didn't report an NDE with the group that did have an NDE, and there's a yeah. significant difference. That experiment's been repeated over and over again, published in peer-reviewed journals. And it's it didn't just have a brain. What does that mean? I, I, my impression is these people are in the hospital and they're lying there on the hospital bed. Well, this is during resuscitation, so we're asking them to recall their experience during resuscitation. Yeah. As you know, within 10 to 15 seconds after you have cardiac arrest, your EEG is flat. I mean, that's just yeah. that's just the way that it is. And yeah. people aren't, and another guy, a prominent cardiologist in the Netherlands, Dr. Pin van Lommel, who's published in The Lancet about this, as he mm -hmm. tells you, will tell anyone, you know, in the modern hospital, resuscitation doesn't begin until at least a minute after that cardiac arrest has happened and and, and yeah. so there, there's no there's no brain function during resuscitation that we know of i don't know enough about this stuff to have an intelligent opinion and of course it might turn out uh, that the uh, the 100 years from now we'll have this conversation in in heaven or in my case more likely the other place <laughs> <laughs> the idea that uh, you had to have a brain in order to be conscious that was kind of silly idea that people had back in the 21st century that might turn out that way i don't think it will i think it uh, you got to have a brain or some equivalent mechanism now we we don't know how to create consciousness artificially but i don't see any uh, obstacle in theoretically uh, to doing it if the brain can do it then you might be able to do it with some other kind of mechanism but the idea that it could just, so to speak, float around freely without being realized in anything, that does not seem to me a very serious possibility. Yeah, I'm always reluctant to go too far with what it might be or how it might work. I just think, to me, I approach it from the standpoint of, can we falsify the existing hypothesis that it is biological? I don't know. I've you know, there's a lot of people on that and side yeah, of the fence. Look at some of this stuff, but I said the stuff that I have seen, press accounts and so on, tend to be rather anecdotal and not systematic science. Incidentally, we keep going through this. Uh, you're not old enough to remember um, the uh, parapsychology experiments of uh, J.B. Ryan and all those people at Duke. And uh, we heard all this over and over that while well, these experiments keep being repeated, they go over and over. And it turned out it, there was really nothing there <laughs> under a serious examination. So they, and of course, we knew, I guess, that they would, uh, that parapsychology would become resuscitated. I don't hear much about Ryan anymore and his group, but there are other groups. Yeah. Boy, that's a, a long, a long tale to to kind of pull into this conversation. W why don't you tell us this to kind of wrap things up? What do you see as the the most interesting future research areas that kind of pique your interest in terms of wrestling some of this stuff to the ground? Okay, to me, the most exciting question in the sciences today, and that's anywhere in the sciences, is how exactly do brain processes cause consciousness, and how exactly is consciousness realized, and how does it function in the brain? I woke up this morning, 
And I went from being in a state of unconsciousness to a state of consciousness. What exactly happened in my brain that enabled that to take place? And then how is it exactly that, that consciousness with a specific location, specific biochemical, electrical, chemical processes in the brain can then function in such a way as to cause me to get up, have breakfast, come to the campus, and engage in this conversation with you? So what exactly is the role of a consciousness in our life and how does it lock into all of these lower level neurobiological processes uh, that enable it to function so for example if I now raise my arm I know I can only raise my arm because the brain is secreting acetylcholine at the uh, end plates of the motor neurons and that means that the conscious decision to raise my arm has also have to level of description where it's got neurobiological properties now, what I think is the most fascinating question in the science is how the hell does all of that work? How does the brain create consciousness? And then how does the complex system containing a level of description which is conscious and other levels of description which are straightforward biochemical and neurobiological and physiological, how does that operate in, in, the, in the behavior of the whole system? Those to me are exciting questions. Dr. Soule, you have a number of uh, interesting, well-done videos out there, the, a TED Talk. You have uh, a number of other videos people can find on YouTube. Tell us yeah. a little bit about what's coming up for you. Do you have any presentations? I know you're in the school year, so probably not. What's coming up for you in terms of presentations or books or anything like that? I'm writing a couple of books. I'm finishing a book on perception, and that's a tough one to do, but I'm, I'm making progress with that. I think I've got some of that figured out, and that I should have finished before Christmas. Um, and I'm going to be giving various lectures at various places. I'm giving a lecture in New York at the end of September about speech act theory, about the philosophy of language. And, of course, I continue to give lectures on this other question that fascinates me, and that is how do we create a reality which is, exists only because we think it exists. And I'm thinking of things like money and property and government and marriage and universities and cocktail parties. And I have an account of how that works. How is it that people get together and cooperate and create this very powerful social and institutional reality? Uh, and I, according to me, according to my account of this, language is crucial. Uh, we use language not just to describe reality, but language is used to create a, a social and institutional reality. So all those are questions I'm working on. Well, it sounds like fascinating and important work. We look forward to seeing it all. It's been great having you on. Thanks for joining me. Okay. Well, great talking to you, and I really appreciate it. So thanks again to Dr. Searle for joining me today on Skeptico. I do appreciate him coming on, and I did have a little bit of a follow-on email with him along the lines that we've talked about here, but it really didn't go anywhere, so I don't need to share any of that with you. I have, as you know, teed up a question or two from this interview at the beginning of this, so we'll just kind of we'll leave that as it stands. But I am looking forward to the dialogue that we might have about this interview and about the skeptical bullies and their attack on Rupert Sheldrick's Wikipedia page and on Wikipedia in general and on Reddit and on iTunes and everywhere else that these folks seem to congregate and focus their attention. Look forward to talking with you about that. Of course, the place to connect with me on that is through the Skeptico website at skeptico.com. You can leave me a comment right there on the website. Bounce over to our forum and join the discussion or drop me a note on Facebook or through email. Well, I have a number of interesting shows coming up. I'm trying to get to this small collection of interviews that I've done on some of the outer limits of consciousness, but other stuff just seems to keep popping up and I never get to publish these other interviews, but I promise I'll get around to them just as soon as I can. In the meantime, I thank you again for listening Please reach out to anyone else who you think who would be interested in this show or who would like to come along on this little Skeptico journey we're all on. So then that's going to do it for today. Take care and bye for now. 